Leon's got a fantastic tie. <laughs> Smart man. Okay, hi everybody. Hello. Hello, everybody. Okay. Hello, everybody. We're going to get started. So those who are not staying for this session, um, please, uh, uh, if you are welcome to stay, absolutely. And otherwise, if you're here for the session, uh, I welcome you to sit down. Great. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so, my name is Teresa Swinehart. I'm with ICANN and oversee uh, strategy and strategic initiatives. And uh, this panel is on uh, universal acceptance and challenges and its significance. Um, this does build on some other conversations that have been occurring uh, around universal acceptance. There was a session yesterday, uh, and uh, we appreciate that there's also uh, many other conversations and sessions around uh, the topic at this meeting here. Um, before we go to our panel, um, just a couple words more generally around um, universal acceptance. Um, uh, for those less familiar with it, uh, what it means is that all domain names and all email addresses work in all software applications. That is that the applications are able to accept, validate, process, store, and display all domain names and email addresses. It's actually a very important area of work uh, to provide broader access to in end users, uh, and especially for those who read and write in different languages and scripts globally. Uh, and so as the internet expands into different languages and globally, uh, this is a really fundamentally important area uh, of work that needs to be addressed in order to ensure that everybody can converse in their local languages uh, and have everything resolved very well. Uh, from ICANN's perspective, um, we've realized that this is a fundamental and significant issue and that there are still challenges that need to be addressed. And with that, have also made sure that this topic is part of our uh, upcoming uh, uh, new strategic plan for the period of 2021 through 2025. Namely, that unique identifier systems with the strategic goal to foster competition, consumer choice, and innovation in the internet space by increasing awareness and encouraging readiness for universal acceptance, IDN implementation, and IPv6. So this is a priority area for the organization uh, building into our operating plan. Uh, and with that, there's also been a lot of work in the community. 
Um, I'd like to um, go to our panelists and then we can obviously open it up for questions. Uh, we're going to start out with Dr. Data, uh, and, uh, who is remote, uh, the chair of the Universal Acceptance Steering Group. Uh, and we're going to ask him to explain uh, some of the issues around this more specifically. I will then go to uh, Leon Sanchez, uh, our ICANN board member and vice chair, and ask him to share the vision of the ICANN board on some of the issues. Uh, I will then turn to Manal, uh, to my right, uh, who's the chair of the Governmental Advisory Committee, uh, but she's also here in her capacity as a policymaker uh, in Egypt and part of the Egyptian government, and ask her to talk a little bit about some of the issues that governments have identified. And then lastly, I will turn uh, to Nick uh, Smith, uh, to my left, uh, who's part of the Dynamic Coalition on the DNS Initiative, uh, and ask him to talk a little bit about that. Uh, so with that, uh, do we have Dr. Data on the on the phone for the remote? Yes, I am very much here. I hope you can hear me. I am Ajay Data, uh, all the way from India. I hope you can hear me. I can't hear the response back. But yes, we can hear you very well. Hear me. Uh, let me uh, start with just directly saying that universal acceptance has a very clear vision for promoting a practice so that all the domain names and all email addresses are treated equally in all the software applications. It sounds simple. It is a problem right now in almost all the applications which we use in today's life. The mission is to mobilize the software application developers to get their products UA ready by providing encouragement, documentation, case studies, and tools so that they can modify their applications to be UA ready and engage with the end user experience in much more better way. Obviously, the impact is going to be large as uh, it has been already told to promote the consumer choice, improve competition, and more importantly, break the language barrier of people. Universal acceptance has a small scope around domain names and email addresses. The new top level domain names, which means we had a original .com, .net, like seven of them, and now we can have .sky, .ing, .sbi, like that. So they should be accepted in all the applications well enough, and they should not be rejected. If somebody registers a domain name on .sky, for example, it should be considered as valid. And a lot of applications, if they block that only seven uh, top original domain names will be accepted, it's a UA issue. Longer top-level domain names, which means now, a person can have a top level domain name of 64 characters like .com. I could have .accountant, .professional, .technology, like in uh, UASG, .tech is more than three characters. These are all fall under a category of long top level domain name. Third category is internationalized domain name, which means a domain name having a ASCII character. An Arabic domain name or a domain name in India, we have 15 language domain names. So these are the called as IDNs, which are in a character other than ASCII. And fourth thing is internationalized domain name having an email address, which is in email address internationalization, which means when we talk about IDNs, we will obviously have an email ID on that. And these email IDs will be completely non-English and or at least have any ASCII email address, ASCII character in that email address. And that will be known as email address internationalization. These are the roughly four scope which we have, which we promote and tell people that these are the domain names coming out of these top level domain names or IDNs and EI must be treated equally. So how do we see that is, are you UA ready or not? So let us say you all came to IGF and I'm sure that you also registered somewhere on IGF as a panelist or as a visitor or as a registrant and you use your email address, which was typed 
on a web page on IGF and you type your ASCII email address. If the web page allows you to type and accepts it as a valid email address, the first checkbox which we ask people to accept is that email at the ID which was created out of this scope which I just talked should be accepted. So we, never, we must remember that the first word is accept. The websites and the softwares must accept these IDs and the domain names in their applications. Second is validate. So if the email address is typed in, then it must validate as a valid email ID. So if it rejects, then it is obviously failing as a UA ready email ID. Third is obviously it should store. So if you type an email ID, the service provider or the owner of that website or the company behind it must store that email ID properly without distorting the data in it or without losing the information in it. It must store it well the way it is typed in and the way it was validated. Then process it well, which means it should be processed to send you a welcome email ID, send you a link, send you a confirmation, whatever is required. That email ID should be accepted, validated, stored, and then processed it well so that the whatever use of that email ID is, is done perfectly. And then when you require it to display it back, you should display it back. So I'm repeating the five words, accept, wait, store, process, and display. These are the five steps which are required in every software to be UA ready. Universal acceptance steering group is all, all about domain names and email IDs and where it is practiced that all kind of domain names which are be provided by anybody doesn't matter must be accepted as a valid domain name if it is valid and must be treated as a valid email ID if it is valid email ID in this area. Just to give you a little bit about while I am uh, chair, we have three vice chairs along in the uh, admin group, which are uh, Dennis from VeriSign, Mark from uh, Microsoft, and Dusan is from Gansi. His company is based out of Arabia. And we uh, run as an elected leadership to run this organization with large uh, volunteers around. When we uh, started uh, in this new uh, year in March 2019, the strategic uh, action plan also is getting uh, formed. And now we have full strategic action plan for the year. And this has a large number of community stakeholders. We have summed up together in six of them, the technology enablers. These people who enable technologies like the standard makers, maybe ITF, maybe W3C, maybe the framework makers like Java, Python, and .NET, anybody who is make, enable the technology for all of us, these people come under that category. We go and influence them so that they make all the technologies UA ready and they enable that. Technology developers is the second category where we go to the people and tell them about technology, which you are developing, maybe a mobile app, maybe a website, maybe a software for something else, then you are making a UA ready software. So once the framework is UA ready, application is UA ready, then obviously you are expecting the world to be more better than what it is today so that it does not reject a domain name and email address. Third category is email software and service providers. So this category is divided into two. So email software providers are like Zimbra, Xgen Plus, CoreMail, ThrowMail, these people who are building the software for email service providers. These people need to be uh, ready, including the post fix and send mail, which are open source. And people who are service providers like Google, Microsoft, and other people in the world who provide services. So they need to be UA ready. So first we have to target the UA readiness into the software so that they accept an email they reject and they do not reject an email coming from an ID and email address. It is very important to note and tell you here that Microsoft and Google both, which are giant, we all know that, have made their software and email platform UA ready to an extent that you can send an email to Google framework or Google app server on a Microsoft server and get a reply from uh, their servers to any EI address. 
this much they have enabled it it's a big support and big commitment towards your readiness fourth category we have is influencing individuals and organizations and that is one of the reason we are talking to you today because we know that you are all influential you can when you go back to your community you can tell people that you have to have software which are you are ready you can tell to your government they have to be you are ready i have an hindi email id which i am going to actually type in at the end when uh, which is coming in then uh, once i type in my email id it is going to be very very uh, good example for you to go back in your software and see whether it is going to be useful in your uh, software whether you can validate it that email id in you can send me an email into my, my system all those things are going to be tested on that email id you can try out it will be my personal email id and the sixth is the government policy makers these government policy people who are producing software for citizens to be used or internally government managed then this should be this should be you are ready which means that the software which government offers citizens if i have a, i am a citizen and i have a hindi email id then can i use my email id to communicate with the government without any rejection so these are the people as per our strategic plan are being targeted as a community stakeholder just for the sake of purpose because your screen of presentation is not there with you then technology enablers technology developers email software providers e email service providers influencing individuals and government policy makers these are the people whom we are targeting now with this when we started working we thought that only obviously four elected people can't do this job we need large volunteers and we have large volunteers we are now 500 plus volunteers in our group this is probably the largest group which is open we do not reject anybody we want people to come in and participate this is the whole global wide problem with the three people four people cannot just solve the problem sitting there in the respective countries so there are working groups which are technology working group which focuses on technology plans coordinate and oversees the work on standards works on practices and programming like programming languages and tools so that anybody who needs support on technology this working group can support that and suggest what is required or not required second is ei working group email address internationalization that plans executes and engages with the service provider and software providers to make them ei ready measurement working group that plans and measures actually what is what is your readiness the effort which we are doing is it really working and we also measure the software which we are actually in the process of measuring some cms and some python applications or php applications that can we make them ui ready by measuring them their ui readiness how far we are and make the remedial effort to it another very important aspect we are taking is local initiative where we obviously do not know the whole world all cultures all geographies how they work so we depend on the local community where people can get together and they suggest us what is required to promote your readiness there and the community proposes us we bring them together support them with the content support them with the technology support them with the documents so that they can go back in their respective local community and promote your readiness i we have already approved a local initiative in india we have uh, from uh, africa we have from china we are uh, we have from uh, uh, i think cis we are moving in that direction to approve many local initiatives so that our reach is much more greater much more broader much more deeper than what we have right now sitting here at centralized location and the last is ua ambassadors and i would like to also leave a message here after this ua ambassador is a group which we appoint as an individual who is an influencer who believes in ua initiative and take the initiative in the local community he talks about ua in the local community he is our ear and eye and what is required there so we have eight ua ambassadors right now and if you have more people who you think can be a good person out of your community out of your uh, so the ac is if you are uh, reporting from i can or anybody in from igf we would be very happy to talk 
with through our icon gsc team and see that can we appoint more ambassadors globally we need more and more who can take this initiative further we have many organizations which are supporting us uh, globally so how can you help that that's the important uh, thing which i would like to leave with so can you take our message to the or to the people whom you know around who serve large audiences who are providing even services can they be ai ready can you influence us can you connect with us and take the message can you be our ambassador to take the message forward and take the ua initiative in your own region another benefit another help you can do is in your own organization can you identify when you are uh, modifying your software how soon you are buying a new software can you ensure that whenever you buy a new software or when you are modifying a software you can see that can you start a ua practice within your own organization the good part is you will be able to deal with the next billion people which are going to come online with a different id so you will be able to deal with the large customer base which is going to come another benefit is which is maybe a small benefit for you we are looking for case studies who have taken an effort who have make and make their organizations you are ready so that we can do the case studies and motivate more people and give you a global uh, awareness about your company by taking the initiative to the public at large i think uh, that's all from my side to kick start this uh, discussion here i hope this will be helpful i am staying around thank you very much for the opportunity and listening to me thank you and sorry i could not join you physically thank you thank you very very much that was a, a really very useful comprehensive overview uh, not only of what the issue is uh, in our on the categories around acceptance validating and, and obviously the processing and some of the challenges uh, but also the need to create awareness around this um, so Leon, can I turn to you to talk a little bit about um, ICANN and the board's perspective on this? Thank you very much, Teresa Leon Sanchez from the ICANN board. And I think this is on top of uh, the board's mind and, and the board's priorities. And that's why we have incorporated this as one of our strategic objectives, uh, specifically strategic objective three, is uh, in regard to evolve the unique identifier systems to continue to serve the needs of the global internet user base. And within this strategic objective, we have, we have formulated strategic uh, goal 3.1, which is to encourage readiness for universal uh, acceptance, ID and implementation, and IPv6 by increasing awareness to enable more end users to use the internet. Because we see these as uh, an issue that goes to the core of inclusivity and, and to the core of the spirit of the internet, right? So uh, many of us are multilingual, many of us have different scripts in, uh, in use, and this goes to the identity that we actually uh, use as uh, internet users. So uh, as I said, I. I I believe this is a, a top priority for, for, for the board, and it, it has also uh, established a, a working group on uh, domain names universal acceptance. I, in fact, have uh, Lito Ivara, who is a member of that uh, working group, and I, I, I believe that I have other board members joining us today, but I can tell you some of the, the membership of this uh, working group is uh, Harald Alvestrand, uh, Lito Ivara, Manal Ismail, Merike Keo, uh, uh, Akinor Memur, and, and Kave, Kave Ranchbar. So, uh, as you can see, there are many board members working on this, and some of the uh, ob objectives that, uh, these, uh, that this working group has is to, of course, enable the organization to better support the community in discussing and advancing uh, this very important subject. Uh, as you might be aware, within the ICANN community, there is a, a, a general acceptance tiering group uh, since 2015, and it has produced a wide variety of materials that are being published and are made available for uh, those interested in consuming them to actually access them. So uh, I think that uh, Dr. Data said 
uh, a lot of things that I that I want to say, uh, but this this uh, universal acceptance steering group has an action plan for uh, fiscal year 20, and uh, they are targeting different actors within the internet ecosystem to create awareness uh, about universal acceptance and the importance thereof. Uh, and, and they are looking at uh, technology enablers, technology developers, email software and service providers, influencing individuals and organizations that are active in this sphere, and also try to build capacities and to create awareness within government policy makers. Uh, I mean, I, I've been uh, a, a beneficiary of universal acceptance myself and also a victim of uh, some systems that are not universally uh, uh, accepting uh, email addresses, for example, right? So, so my personal email address is a .mx address. And when I sometimes put this into a form, a registration form in some systems, it will tell me, okay, that's a not valid email, right? Because it's, it's not configured to accept the .mx extension as a valid email address extension. So again, this goes to the very core of inclusivity and diversity within the internet and to the way we identify ourselves within the ecosystem. So again, this is on, tops, uh, on top of, of, of the board's priorities. It's been incorporated to the strategic plan and we will continue to uh, develop uh, strategies and means to, as I said, uh, enable the organization to better support the community in its efforts to achieve this universal acceptance. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. Yeah, there's quite a bit of work going on and certainly a commitment in, in the strategic plan around that. Um, Manal, can I ask you to talk a little bit um, from the GAC perspective, but also from experience maybe in Egypt? Um, around this that would be great. Thank you, Teresa. And um, so let me start by saying that um, so I, I can introduce IDNs, and, and this was um, a significant step and a milestone. Uh, but um, unfortunately, we're not able yet to bear the fruits of this uh, important milestone without universal acceptance. Um, at an earlier workshop yesterday, URID study, uh, they mentioned, Emily mentioned that, uh, I'm not sure about the percentage, but something like 80 or 81% uh, of the registered ID and domain names are parked. So they are not really utilized yet. And out of a national experience as well. We had thousands of uh, registrations at the very few days when we uh, launched the ID and CCTLD. Those are continued to be static for a while and now even uh, declining because uh, people are not renewing their registrations because email addresses are not working smoothly and, and all the universal um, acceptance issues. So, um, having said that, and, and, and of course, universal acceptance would be of um, direct benefit to the end users having um, a seamless end-to-end multilingual uh, multi uh, internet experience, uh, but also I see it as a bigger market to, to the, the private sector. Um, and now focusing more on the government side to answer your question, um, a, a, a direct thing would be that governments would naturally uh, want to um, communicate and, 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 and reach out to their citizens in the official language of the country. So again, we need to secure this um, uh, communication um, in the, the language uh, of, of the country, but also to make sure they in include everyone to the digital world, 
those who uh, masters foreign language, but also those who don't. Uh, we're talking about the next billions, and I'm sure uh, the next billions have different needs from those who are already online. So we need also to uh, bear this in mind. And while we're talking about digital inclusion and, and, and uh, having a, a digital society, we need to make sure that everyone is included and no one is left behind. Um, so definitely this would um, help increase internet penetration uh, in, at disadvantaged, uh, disadvantaged communities. Um, this would be uh, also preservation for the cultural identity, even to those who know the language and those who don't have a problem or a language barrier. Again, preserving the cultural identity is, uh, is an important aspect as well. Uh, and, and also having uh, meaningful uh, access uh, through the internet with everything moving online, all uh, activities, all day-to-day uh, -day, uh, errands, and, and uh, we, we cannot leave uh, anyone behind. Uh, we try to coordinate this um, uh, at, at the national level. We, we're starting uh, with the government, since we are the government, and it's, it's good to have a government as a role model or, uh, or at least a proof of concept for others to, uh, uh, to, uh, to follow. We, we're working on awareness um, and I have to say we thought that maybe we can start by decision makers and this would facilitate everything, but out of experience and also confirming what Edmund mentioned yesterday, it turned out to be um, better to work maybe both sides, top down and bottom up, because I mean, we got clearance to have a pilot uh, for um, email uh, address internationalization, but then people who would really do this and implement it, they would also be introducing something new even to themselves and they have to give support to this new platform. So they need to be really familiar with, with everything because again, the message is get it done but without breaking anything that's working and without compromising any of the security measures. So everyone is really cautious, so it, it's taking longer than uh, we expected. Um, so many awareness meetings, many uh, uh, workshops and many uh, trainings. We are lucky also to have um, a universal acceptance uh, stakeholder group ambassador uh, in, in, in Egypt. So he's, he's doing a great job reaching out to um, government entities but also to uh, the academic sector. Uh, we have done a couple of hackathons and they turned to be extremely useful, again with the help of uh, uh, the Universal Acceptance Steering Group. Um, and, and frankly speaking, at the beginning of the hackathon, I, I was not that optimistic because the students didn't know anything about universal acceptance. But by the end of the three days, they really developed some uh, good stuff and, and even the instructors were impressed. So. Um, it's it's not, might not be something that would have an immediate uh, effect, but again, it's it's a good way looking forward. Um, and we're also talking about IDNs and universal acceptance within the curricula of uh, um, some uh, institutes and some universities uh, in Egypt. Um, and one last thing uh, before I hand over to you, Teresa, is uh, the GAC. We've also been uh, discussing this with the GAC. And uh, in Montreal, we decided to uh, create a, a working group on IDNs and universal acceptance. And I hope this would help us also reach out to other governments, 
within the membership of the GAC and, and maybe establish the right channels to spread the, the word over. Because one of the challenges of universal acceptance is the need for a wide deployment. Otherwise, again, you won't benefit really from uh, the, 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 the idea of universal acceptance. And I'll stop here. Sorry if I took longer than no. I intended. Thank you. Not at all. This is really informative and the example of a hackathon and maybe some lessons learned from that and, and then the, the, the conversation in the GAC and various things are opportunities to learn from each other uh, very much so. Uh, before I open uh, the floor uh, for, uh, for discussion and questions to the panelists, uh, uh, including uh, Dr. Dada, who's online and, and will be able to respond to anything. Nick, I wonder if I could um, ask you to talk a little bit about the work of the Dynamic Coalition uh, sure. and what's happening. Absolutely. Thank you, Teresa. Um, first of all, I just want to commend uh, the work that um, my fellow panelists up here are doing. Um, it's, it's remarkable. Um, I'll start with just some of the words that I heard from Dr. Dada as well. Um, and Manal just, just now. Um, what our Dynamic Coalition is trying to do um, is number one, help the community. Um, number two is to familiarize the people that we're working with. So last year um, in Paris, we had our inaugural kickoff um, of the DC DNSI. Uh, which is the DNS issues. That's, that's a very broad topic. But we wanted to focus on one area in particular importance, and we felt that universal acceptance um, is where we wanted to take for our first initiative for the first year. So here we are. Um, it's been a year since we started. Um, throughout the year, we, uh, the DC DNSI has um, participated um, and multiple MAG meetings that they had earlier this year. Um, we had uh, the luxury of, of being able to engage with um, a lot of the colleagues in the room around the table, um, as well as in the audience. I see some of them from CDIG um, as well. Um, just really amplifying the importance. Um, and I want to be very clear that our work has never been to necessarily dis, you know, duplicate the work that's already being done by the ITF or uh, the UASG. It's to complement. Um, and we wanted to be very strategic um, in our approach to how we did that. Um, but uh, most importantly, um, I think it goes back um, to the question of, of how we get there. Um, yesterday we um, had our, our session uh, for 90 minutes talking about some of the areas, and I, I think it speaks to what's already been set up here, is that um, it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all equation to this. Um, to, get public sector readiness to get that understood, um, you have to work through multiple layers uh, to actually achieve that success. So what we've been trying to do is just provide that platform um, within our own capacity within the IGF. Uh, so um, we will continue that mantra um, as respect to where our plans go from here. Like I said, um, we did choose universal acceptance for the first year. Um, we did take part in a pilot survey uh, where we did not have um, the responses that we were hoping for, as it is very challenging, but um, what we're planning for in, in the first part of 2020 is to do a more comprehensive survey, global survey, um, and to get that out there and provide those resources and provide those tools. Um, and beyond that, we'll, we'll probably shift to a different topic within the DNS, DNS but um, this has been our focus. And then just lastly, um, I'll say that I think the help piece is so critical. Um, when we first started in Paris, we had, uh, I think, roughly about 20 members. Um, now I think we're probably over 100. So um, within a year's time, um, I, I, all, all we just want to say is thank you, and um, uh, we look forward to continuing to work with the community. That's great. Thank you. That really complements all the rest of the, the efforts underway. Um, I, I understand from my colleagues, uh, Dr. Dada, that you had a few things that you just wanted to comment on before we open it up for discussion. Uh, if I can turn that over to you. Maybe? No? Uh, 
Uh, do, do we have him online or should I open it for? Uh, just bear with us for one second. Why don't we do this while we're um, while we're waiting to get him online? Oh, we have multiple forms of communication happening. <laughs> okay. Why don't we do this um, while we're waiting for um, uh, for that part of the technology to work? Let me open the floor for. Uh, any questions to the panelists or any uh, discussion uh, around this? Roberto, if I could turn it to you. Hi, um, Roberto Gaetano, Internet user. Um, I, I would like uh, to raise an issue, considering that uh, also um, ICANN uh, uh, is present as uh, staff as board and board uh, to this discussion. Um, I, uh, yesterday, I, I have... Um, I thought, uh, uh, because of all the problems that I hear about uh, um, email not working and so on, I had this idea of um, uh, just um, um, getting for myself um, um, an IDN uh, uh, domain name and, uh, uh, with, uh, and then try to figure out how does it feel to have an, uh, an IDN uh, uh, email address uh, and what are the problems and, uh, you know, uh, how does it work. Um, so I went to the website of my um, favorite uh, registry that, um, uh, that is PIR, uh, still in spite of what has happened uh, recently. And, uh, and I, have, uh, I found the list of uh, all registrars. The, 411 registrars who register.org. And uh, as you probably know, um, PIR has uh, um, also .org in uh, different scripts. And so I picked up uh, the less incomprehensible to me, that is um, the Cyrillic. And I said, OK, I will uh, register a domain name with a registrar um, with .org in Cyrillic. Um, so I looked at the list, and out of 411, there were only 28 registrars who um, proposed uh, .org in Cyrillic. Not even my favorite registrar, that, by the way, is in this room today, uh, carries um, .org uh, um, in Cyrillic. Now, I understand that there are business models for registrars, and uh, if uh, uh, a registrar doesn't, uh, doesn't um, find this uh, um, uh, a good uh, a good business. They are uh, perfectly free um, not to do it. But I was wondering, from ICANN's side, is there anything that ICANN can do in terms of uh, um, putting different uh, conditions uh, for the um, the commercialization of, um, um, of uh, uh, domain name in Cyrillic. I know, uh, because I used to be on the board of PIR, that, for instance, uh, um, PIR has still to pay uh, yearly fees, regardless of the fact that uh, the IDNs are, are um, sold or not. So there seems to be something, in my opinion, that, uh, that I can, can do um, so that uh, uh, it can be an incentive uh, uh, not a burden for the registries uh, and an incentive for registrars uh, um, uh, in order to, um, um, you know, push more uh, uh, the sale of uh, um, domain name. Because I think that we are in a vicious circle. So um, IDNs don't work uh, because there's not enough pressure from the users uh, to demand uh, to the infrastructure provider to fix things. But since the, the, the infrastructure is, uh, is not ready, then uh, the users are not even buying the, the IDNs. So there's something that we all have to do in order to break the, the, the vicious circle. Thank you. 
Thank you, Roberto. I think it's all part of the awareness raising. Does anybody want to respond to Roberto there on this? No? Mihaly? You want to respond. Yes. I will turn it over to your favorite. Uh, good morning. Uh, Michaeli Nalen uh, from Black Knight. Hopefully still Roberto's favorite registrar. I'm not sure. Um, I think actually Roberto does raise a couple of interesting points, but I'm not sure if they're the right points. The, it, it may be there is something that both the registries and ICANN c could do to incentivize registrars to, to carry IDNs. But I mean, of the IDNs that we've actually carried, the issue we've run into is that there's very little demand. So I'll take the example of the .ie CCTLD. The Irish language uh, in its current script is, is essentially, it's, a lat it's Latin with one, or two, with one or two extra characters, but like a basic accent. So in some respects, similar to Italian. Uh, the .ie CCTLD existed for over 20 years without the support of any IDN. So you couldn't register your name in the correct, in the correct way under .ie. And if you actually look into the difference between the words in, our, in the Irish language with the father and without the father, some of the differences are quite hilarious. For those who are interested, go to FADA.ie, where, where we've published a bunch of examples. When they actually launched .ie and they the .ie IDN, and they did quite a bit of, of marketing around it, the take-up was negligible. I think at this stage now there are three, three .ie domain names registered with, with the accents. And this is for a European country that's pretty well connected, reasonably good on the kind of technology side, where all of our official documents from our government are available in both languages, and a lot of my staff would have names that uh, the Americans in the audience would be incapable of pronouncing. So, you know, if you can't get people to register domains with a, li with a little accent on them in a European language, expecting them to, to register them in some other kind of more exotic language can be a problem. But I think part of this goes back to other things. Is, it, is the infrastructure there in, the, in those countries where those languages are being spoken? Is it, do peop are people actually producing content in those languages? Is that, you know, those are the other drivers that I would look at around demand, not simply a case of you now have this, this domain, but if the, for example, you know, there's other pressures and other barriers to connectivity, maybe those are the ones that we should be looking at rather than trying to get people to register a, a bunch of IDN domains that just end up being parked. Thanks. Oh, and Roberto, I'll check up my technical team for enabling those IDNs for you. It, it's an interesting. Um, it's an interesting point. It, it goes a little bit to Manal's point about the whole experience um, with the content, and then the seamless experience um, in the communication uh, with the addressing system. Uh, Ram, I understand that you have your hand up, and thank you for waving. This pillar is a little bit uh, of a challenge. <laughs> thank you. I'm, I'm Ram Mohan. Um, I. So, you know, one of the questions that you were asking was, had to do with, you know, what things could be done. And uh, in yesterday's session, uh, it, it, yesterday morning session, there was quite an ins uh, insightful set of comments about uh, why IDNs or the multi multilingual internet has not really taken off, and there's all kinds of different reasons for it. But one that uh, seems quite appealing is that there is a market failure. Uh, Edmund actually brought this up, uh, and if you if you look at this from an economics point of view, and and you look at you research what is market failure, that's an inefficient distribution of goods and services in a free market, and I think that is kind of the classic definition of what is happening with IDNs and and with 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 this entire this ecosystem, right? And the second piece of market failure is that individual incentives for rational behavior do not lead to rational outcomes, right? 
and, and you're seeing that as well happening in the, in the IDN marketplace. You have folks who are positing that this needs, uh, if only there was more education, if only there were more incentives, if only more registrars offered this or more registries offered this, if only there was more content, etc. cetera. Uh, but perhaps there is a case to be made that uh, what we actually should be looking at with IDNs in particular is we should be considering IDNs in the phase of development that it's at now as public goods. And if you look at public goods that, uh, and the way public goods are, are viewed and dealt with in society, you look at uh, the upkeep of parks or um, you know, the, the metro system or things like that, those are things that are, uh, those are goods that are um, undertaken with the pre-existing assumption that there will be market failure, right? And, and those public goods are not normally successful in the private sector. And maybe there is now enough evidence with almost a decade of offering IDNs in the marketplace that uh, the private sector is not going to be able to just single-handedly support the uh, adoption or the engagement or the, um, um, you know, the growth of IDNs in a multilingual internet. And maybe it's time to start thinking of IDNs uh, as a public goods rather than a free market enterprise. That's an interesting, that's an interesting concept. It goes a little bit to Michele's. Uh, Edmund, can I turn it to you? I, or Denka, did you want to comment? Oh, okay. Edmund, please. Yeah, uh, Edmund Chung here. Ram basically said everything that I want to, I put my hand up to say. Um, just, just following through, I mean, that's what Roberto mentioned uh, is, is as, as Ram mentioned uh, that I, I talked about yesterday. It, I think we are looking at, staring really at a classic example of a market failure here. Um, and the supply side is just not, uh, not, not re ready to, 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 to complete the work, and therefore there is latent demand. I mean, the demand couldn't be revealed. That's, that's, the, that, that's one of the important pro problems. But um, I, if, we, if we build on that, though, uh, one of the things that we, we might want to think about is with ICANN's uh, strategic uh, goal, having this as part of the ICANN strategic goals, what can ICANN and the ICANN community actually uh, actually proactively do because um, in in the past uh, a lot of the discussion has been hey we, we should let the market uh, develop we, we create the awareness and then you know uh, build it and, and and people would come it seems like that's that's not going to happen but uh, that's not uh, it seems like there's evidence that that alone will not get us over the hump so now we got to go back and think through is this is this policy is this incentives is this you know where where in the community could this uh, discussion continue to grow and there that is one also one area that um, I, I guess for myself that's the last few years I couldn't quite figure out where in the community could could this uh, conversation actually gets started so that uh, some of the solutions for market intervention, because when where there's market failure, there should be market intervention. How could we get that started? Uh, you know, is is it within ICANN or ICANN facilitated uh, uh, kind of uh, groups to to get this started? Thank you, um, Leon. Please. Thank you, Teresa. So, Edmund, I, I think that the discussion is happening, right? It's taking place. Uh, there's this, the steering group. I mean, there are many places in which uh, this is happening. The GAC has a, a working group on this. Uh, the at-large community has a working group on this as well. Uh, so I guess it's just that we haven't found the mechanism in which we can actually materialize this discussion and, 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 and this uh, 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 dialogue that is happening into actions, right? So. From the board's perspective, our strategic plan is it's, it's, a, it's a living document. And we have set some goals there, some expected outcomes that we wish that we actually achieve. But I think it's also for us as a board and you as, as part of the community to engage, you know, in this circle of community, board, and, and, and organization to 
find the ways and the mechanisms to actually implement what is being discussed and the conclusions that you are reaching within the community into operable actions and, 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 and how we as support can enable the organization to support you in that effort. So I would definitely encourage us to engage and, and, and through the uh, universal acceptance uh, uh, working group within the board, establish this dialogue and, and try to find ways in which, which we can operationalize uh, whatever outcome uh, the working groups are, 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 are establishing in order to achieve this common goal. Edmund, do you want to respond? And then we have uh, Dr. Tata. We've been uh, just a very quick response, uh, Edmund. Here, um, the reason why I brought it up is that um, at the end of the day, if we got to create public good, if we got to create incentives, it's about funding. It's also about how money is being part of it. So that's that's uh, that's the diff part of the, the the difficult puzzle to to crack. Uh, besides some of the awareness that, that can build from the various groups that you mentioned, but there has got to be some uh, uh, economic mechanisms, and that's that part we probably need ICANN.org to, to be part of the conversation as well. That's the reason, uh, you know, I, I want to highlight that particular part. Thank you. Any comments to that? No? Well, I guess that was the kind of invitation I wanted I, I was actually doing right. Let's let's see together and let's figure out how we can make it happen. Good. Uh, I understand we have Dr. Dada back. Perfect. Let's give this a shot. Could you hear me? Very nice. Yes. No. Uh, we, we can hear you. Can you hear us? OK, great. So uh, I can't hear you uh, back. That's fine. So I just wanted to take this opportunity also to thank uh, Manal uh, with this interesting uh, initiative for building the working group within GAC, because it is a very, very important uh, uh, section where we are uh, looking for government help to build in policies, bring in the policies for procurement and all the stuff, including the ILAC who has uh, built the entire system of working groups and also Naralo and Lakralo has also started working with us to take the initiative further. I think these are all the initiatives which I wanted to uh, sound here that any NDCGNSI, including uh, to take this initiative uh, as a first step to take it further. I think that we need, all of us, we need to work together, adopt ID and the wonderful ideas which I hear as a public good, we will discuss this out and how do we take it further in various countries. We will figure them out, but idea is to keep this action alive and thank you all for joining in this mission and make it more greater for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. And maybe I could ask you a question. Um, I don't know if you heard the part of the conversation about um, the user experience and um, the comments that were made that it's also about multilingual content uh, that helps uh, be a driver uh, for uh, potentially also, also increase in demand uh, uh, for uh, the registration of um, uh, names in IDN or the universal acceptance um, abilities that you had flagged uh, that need to be addressed. Uh, are there any experiences out of India that you're seeing um, or in the work that you're seeing about bridging with content uh, more generally? I, I realize that we're focused very much more on the, the technical and the universal acceptance side, but the bridging of the full experience. Certainly there is a uh, possibility and there is an option uh, which I can share here. Government of Rajasthan started offering a Hindi email ID to every citizen of the state. We are a primarily a Hindi as a language state and we have almost every content available in English on the government websites. The content is not available in Hindi also. All the government orders, maximum government orders comes in English, but we are a Hindi state. It, things are changing. But we could convince government that it's a chicken and egg situation. What do you do first? 
So we said, let's do both. Let's create a content. Let's create the ID and an email, email address and translation, and let's try to bring them together. India has already surpassed. If you Google right now, it's report by KPMG and Google together. India has already surpassed the searches on regional content rather than English. It means the con content is getting created. Content is getting consumed. It's a matter of time that we will have the regional content consumption more than the ASCII or than the English content, whatever uh, people are consuming right now. Things are changing in India for sure. Thanks. That's very interesting. Uh, any? Uh, uh, yes. Yes, sir. Please introduce you. Hi. My name is Satish, and I'm from uh, India. Um, I'm from the at-large community of ICANN. And while I chair the UA tech group uh, in the UASG, uh, I'm actually speaking right now in the capacity of the, the chair of the working group that ALAC has on IDNs. Uh, from an end user perspective, this is, uh, I, UA has become a very serious issue now. Uh, with, as uh, Ajay mentioned, many people are coming out with uh, email, uh, internationalized domain names and email IDs. Uh, I just found that Wikipedia, which is the 10th largest site, does not accept internationalized email IDs for user account registration. Now, it's actually quite serious because Wikipedia itself is very multilingual. And that's the place where we expect that they would accept these email IDs. Now, yesterday, the at-large community made a, we had, we had a call for a public community meeting on UA in here in Berlin. Uh, and several of us present here, Roberto, Liana, we're all in that meeting. And one thing that we came out with was that the at-large community of ICANN, which is again very diverse, global, has a specific role in pushing this agenda of UA uh, everywhere. So uh, some of the, the bottlenecks that were mentioned, of course, we don't do any market level interventions, but advocacy with the government is something that we can do uh, in multiple countries. And we have a presence in uh, a, a very large set of countries. So. Uh, I would just like to state that the at-large uh, IDN working group is being repositioned slightly uh, to include UA as well, and we are going to involve all our membership in specific uh, regions like uh, Latin America, for example, there is a clear set of activities happening on UA. Asia Pacific is very diverse, and we do have uh, a lot of people with skills, like Edmund uh, co-chair is the working group that we have. So I'd just like to place on record that the at-large is trying to uh, reposition its working group to include UAs as a priority item. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, um, and also for the work that's underway there. I know that it bridges with many different groups, so that's, that's going to be important. Um, can, I, can you talk a little bit about um, uh, sort of how this fits into the broader IGF and, and some of the other conversations happening here? Absolutely. So, you know, just thinking about um, this all in the context of, of why we're here within the IGF uh, construct, um, this session is, it falls into the category, obviously, of digital inclusion. Um, and one of the exercises that our coalition took part in earlier this year um, is that we put out um, some questions as it relates to um, the SDGs. Um, and it was, there was a consensus behind that um, the DC coalition and our efforts with, within the realms of UA fall under um, SDG goal nine. Um, and that goal um, wholly focuses on building resilient infrastructure, promoting inclusive and sustainable industrialization and fostering innovation. So uh, the reason why I bring this up um, particularly um, is because you know, we're here at this epicenter of how does this fall into really getting to the, our goals and achieving where we're trying to go. And I think that um, what we would encourage, um, as I kind of alluded to earlier in my first intervention, is that wherever we go in terms of where this messaging should be, please utilize DCs like us that are willing to kind of amplify that message. Thank you. That's actually an important connection to half the other conversations happening here, yes. Um, any, Duncan, did you have any comments that you wanted to make on this? Yes, thank you. Well, 
My name is Danko Jevtovic, and this ch is C with a finger on it, so it's also a problem of universal acceptance. And I'm coming from Serbia, a country that has Cyrillic script as the primary script, and the government is, governmental documents are always in Cyrillic, but we mostly use Latin. So my point that the uh, problem is actually very complicated. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, Serbia is country that been, has been part of a country called Yugoslavia. And I, when I go today to register myself on various websites, I cannot find the name of my country because it exists only for a couple of decades. And uh, then I have to register myself as Yugoslavia or Serbia and Crnagora, what was the intermediate name, and more often I can find Serbia. So this is something that we have to work and fight for. I'm here as a MAG member, but incidentally I'm also an ICANN board member, but I would like to speak more from the IGF's point of view, and I think this is actually, IGF is the right venue to talk about these issues, because I see importance of universal acceptance, and thank you Ram, and thank you Roberto for bringing those from two different perspectives. But I believe that universal acceptance is actually an enabler for multilingual internet, and this is something that is important for us, because we uh, worldwide need content in our languages, and we need uh, local languages to be able to bring uh, next uh, groups, next huge uh, billions, next billions of users to internet. So uh, I think it is very important that we are discussing this. There is good work that's done by ICANN community. Uh, there are priorities that uh, Leon spoke of the, on the ICANN board. Joran, uh, as the CEO and the president of ICANN, is often uh, saying that universal acceptance is his pet project. So uh, a lot of that is done. But as Roberto pointed out, this is kind of a, a chicken and egg problem. And uh, we have to attack from different sides. I think Ram's approach is, is very good and there is something to it. It's in a bit, it's a similar to accepting the IPv6. Until there is no more acceptance, there will be no more requirement. So my uh, call is to support the work of the Universal Acceptance Steering Group and of course of the IGF's uh, dynamic coalition on the NS issues to bring uh, more of these discussions also to future IGFs. Uh, from the sitting of the MAG and uh, our deliberation of the workshops that are selected for IGFs, I can tell you there is a very few proposals relating to DNS and universal acceptance, so we are happy to have this session here, but probably we need more sessions that will focus on the specific issues relating to that. And also, uh, most importantly, uh, on the local level, to require a website uh, to, uh, to work for the annual acceptance, to accept email addresses, not only as communication, which is obvious, but also as identifiers for users, and to, uh, to work locally to create also demand from this side. Because this is a long-term problem, we have to be persistent, and we have to work on all the levels simultaneously. Thank you. Thank you, Denko. It's almost as if we're posing a challenge to ourselves to see an increase in the conversation at the next IGF and maybe um, reporting back on increase in statistics around this. I'll just throw that out there. Um, Roberto, I know you have a comment. We also have somebody online. Was your comment to this, or shall I do the online first? To this. Very good. Go. It was actually an, an announcement. Uh, we are preparing the uh, program for Eurodig uh, 2020 that will be held uh, in Trieste uh, 10 to 12 June. And uh, uh, we are going to have uh, uh, universal acceptance uh, on, on uh, uh, the program. Thank you. That's actually great news. Um, it also brings to mind the, um, the idea, or to your point, um, at the national and regional IGFs. Uh, it's also a great opportunity to put it on the agendas uh, for those programs as well, and that, that, that can also be fed into uh, the global IGF. Uh, Nigel, can I turn to you for the uh, remote question? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, remote uh, comment from uh, Susan Chalmers from the US NTIA, who is a, uh, uh, a member of the uh, Dynamic Coalition as well and was in the, in the session yesterday. 
she says, building upon the comments of uh, Nick, uh, the, the messaging that is put out needs to focus specifically on the power of universal acceptance to enable digital inclusion. And this could help raise awareness and perhaps even drive demand. Universal acceptance should become known to policymakers as a tool to achieve a more multilingual internet. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it does go back to that full experience of, of how we position this and how we pursue it from the multiple different angles, um, whether the technical or the content uh, or the full experience. Does anybody want to comment on uh, Susan's uh, comment or raise anything else uh, from their own observations here? Michele. Uh Yeah, thanks, Michele again. I suppose one of the other things around the universal acceptance, which it has been touched on here, but I think the focus a lot of the time tends to kind of veer immediately into IDNs is, you know, that it's all about getting all domains to work, which includes for Leon, if Leon wants to be able to sign up for something using his punto MAX, or if one of my clients wants to use their dot media or their dot blog or whatever. And speaking as a registrar and hosting provider, the kind of issues we've run into is, is one around that kind of end user experience. You've sold me a faulty product. So somebody buys, buys a domain name from us in good faith, sets up email, all that's working, working fine. They go to sign up for some kind of online service. They try to sign on, log on to the Wi-Fi in a hotel or an airport, and they can't. And then they're on to us going, you know, what the hell did you sell me? This isn't a real domain. Why can't I use this? I'm going to go back to using my Gmail address or whatever. So I think that that's part of the messaging. Because a lot of the time it gets focused around the IDN aspect of it, which is perfectly valid and I totally get it. But there's the bigger issue is if you talk to people just who just are registering domains in Latin characters, you still have thousands of web forms out there that do really, really crappy validation. And if the domain is longer than three characters, it fails. So you can't even register with some of these online services using a dot .name or a dot .info. And I think Affiliates launched dot .info in what, 2002, 2001? Because as I'm off by a year round, don't, don't get attack me. So I mean, like, that's been out there for 18 years and they still can't do it. I mean, this is just kind of basic things. Now, the presentation yesterday we had with the, the lady from the German government, I thought was, that was really cool. That actually got me all kind of interested. So I was like, this is somebody, a government actually stepping up. And that, that's the kind of thing that would be great to see more of. But the, the big challenge has always been, you know, how do we, on the kind of supply business side of it, whatever aspect, how do we encourage developers to use better libraries in their development? How do we encourage people to do better validation of forms? How do we get uh, crazy sysadmins to stop blocking, you know, everything apart from .com? Thanks. Yeah, it, it's a really important, yeah, I, I see exactly where you're going on that. And I think, Lito, uh, you had some observations. Yes, thank you. I was, uh, this is Lito Ibarra, I was thinking about uh, what Mikel just brought up uh, re in relation also to the um, following round of GTLDs, uh, that would be also an issue. We need to, to, to tackle the, the universal acceptance for the long names, long, not, not only IDN, which, is, which of course is uh, the objective is to bring more people into the internet uh, with their own languages and scripts, but also the, the long uh, TLDs are also if we open that and we expect uh, that many applications as we have done in the past, or uh, more or less, uh, we need to solve these issues also as a market consideration, as Roberto also was saying. Thank you. Uh, Menal. Um, thank you, Teresa, and um, also to Michaeli's point, uh, we've been trying to stress the fact that because whenever we say universal acceptance, people tend to think about IDNs uh, only, and, and we keep reiterating this uh, message um, every time, and 
I mean, even at Montreal, we had a few uh, GAC members saying, oh, this is the first time we knew it also implies new GTLDs. So the message is not there fully. And, and, and obviously, this made even more members deciding to join the new uh, working group. So I, I hear where you're coming from. And, and by the way, thanks to India for deciding to lead this GAC working group. And they already have a success story. So. I hope they will, uh, we can see some progress soon. You're good. Uh, any, any other, uh, do we have anybody remote at all? No? Uh, yes, yes, sir. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Liu Yu. I came from China, and uh, also <laughs> I entered the uh, manual uh, on the ATRT from the GAP. But I just to uh, say, uh, UA uh, issues uh, in my personal uh, cap capacity, and uh, uh, I think it's very important. Uh, we talk about the user experience and. Uh, also, we found some uh, big companies like uh, Microsoft, like uh, uh, Google, they uh, launched some uh, program um, to enable the UA on website, on browser, on uh, search engine. So uh, just so if we can uh, involve them into the IGF session to talk about their uh, benefit their experience, how they benefit the local community, and how they earn their uh, uh, benefit on the uh, business and also the social uh, uh, yeah, area. So I think we this will be uh, that will encourage more uh, stakeholders into this uh, process and uh, will enlarge the in experience to uh, the all, all over across the countries. And uh, uh, also another thing, another important thing is that uh, since uh, for the, for the uh, we, we talk about the uh, digital inclusion that uh, we, uh, we do the work to, for the next billion or next, uh, or the underserved uh, region. But uh, uh, as our experience, uh, uh, including uh, China, uh, India, and also Africa, uh, the most uh, uh, growth uh, of internet is mobile internet. So uh, the, for the teenagers, they never use the browser uh, on PC, but they, they most use is uh, mobile APPs. But uh, they, uh, we, they cannot see any domain name on the APP. And, uh, but also uh, in China, uh, we, we, we have some uh, research on and survey that, uh, but uh, we can some, uh, we can saw the short link, uh, that, like a uh, short domain in the content. Uh, when we use Weibo or we use WeChat, we will uh, input some short link in that uh, uh, content. So if, but, uh, most of, uh, user find that the if the short link is uh, impacted the domain name uh, like uh, IDN or like a long uh, domain name, but they cannot uh, link that from the APP to the website. So it's a, it's a, uh, important that we can enlarge our, our uh, Apple or, or Android system. They can do. Uh, to do that, work with the, the uh, mobile phone manufacturer and also the the big uh, the big uh, APP provider, and to to uh, improve the user experience, and uh, I think it's very important and for the uh, young people, young users, and also next billion uh, people, and also I, I want to also <laughs> take some uh, minutes of on the uh, Chinese uh, in community. And uh, 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 in the Montreal uh, ICAM uh, meeting, uh, one of the, uh, we have three ambassadors uh, from, uh, from the China of, to the USD, and the one of them uh, come to the Montreal and, and engage the USD uh, workshop and the, the session and they introduce so, uh, some uh, ideas from Chinese uh, community. And after that, uh, in, in the last month, we uh, discussed uh, several times uh, with the ambassador and also 
uh, we work with the Internet Society of China and also uh, my colleague, uh, my uh, uh, organization, CICT uh, Think Tank. And uh, we, uh, we have uh, draft a plan from the, of the uh, China community and uh, work with the ambassador also uh, USC and also uh, registry, not only from the local company uh, uh, like Ali, Ali, uh, Ali Yun uh, or Ali Cloud like this, but also uh, we have uh, uh, affiliates uh, uh, have their local uh, business being in China. We can uh, work together to uh, push the EOA uh, process in the, in the China. And uh, maybe uh, next month, uh, uh, later in December, we will uh, uh, issue some uh, plan on that and uh, to share with, and also we welcome all stakeholders come to, together, we will uh, work together. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. You've really um, highlighted also the importance of having all the relevant parties uh, in some of these panel discussions. Uh, and I think that's an opportunity for us in the future uh, to Dango's point about making this a, a larger topic also at upcoming IGFs. But Roberto, I, I wonder whether we might pose that as a challenge for your agenda for Eurodig as well. Um, any other, um, any other questions for the panelists at all, or um, any other observations? Nigel, you have a remote? Uh, no, we've got no one, uh, no one on remote. We've got a short uh, announcement at the end, but uh, if, you, if we have any more questions before that. Very good. Would uh, any of the panelists want to make any uh, final remarks or observations uh, before we go to our announcement? No? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you all for what's been a really very useful conversation, and I think it's an important one uh, for multiple reasons for us to be continuing, so I'll look forward to seeing it on the program next year uh, and hopefully at many of the national and regional events uh, that are coming up uh, between then, uh, then and now. Uh, Nigel, I'll turn it to you for the announcement. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, two things, and then I'll hand over to uh, Adam, who will also say something. Uh, Dr. A.J. Data, who was on the, uh, on, on, on the panel, as you know, has, uh, has, has mentioned that he's, he's very, he'd be very happy for people to join the uh, uh, UA uh, the Universal Acceptance Steering Group. Uh, you can go to, the, uh, go to the website and register. It's just uh, uasg.tech uh, and subscribe to that or, or come and see me or another ICANN colleague, and we can, we can put you in touch with the, uh, uh, with the website. Uh, next point, ICANN has a booth. Come to our booth. Uh, we have lots of information there. We have a QR code that you can uh, scan, and that's got some information about universal acceptance as, as, as well. The booth is just in the IGF village, and Adam wants to say something about the booth. Thank you, Nigel. Adam Peake, I'm a member of ICANN staff, and just to let you know that at 12.45, Wolfgang Kleinvector, who I think is very, very, very well known in the IGF community, will be speaking at the booth about the nominating committee, which is a process within ICANN Wolfgang is a member of, uh, to bring in volunteers to join leadership positions. Uh, Wolfgang will explain what the committee does and how it works, but the the, the committee is beginning an application process in mid-November for about two months. We're looking for experts, volunteers to join the leadership of ICANN's various committees and councils and two members of the ICANN board. So please come along to the booth. It's booth 35 in foyer 3, which is the one on the left-hand side as you would walk up the main corridor here. So 12.45, Wolfgang, Wolfgang talking about the nominating committee. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, everybody, uh, and uh, enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thanks. Thank you.